So hello everybody, my name is Axel Simon. I am part of the office of, office of the CTO at Red Hat. I'm part of a part of it called uh, Emerging Technology and we look at sort of future tech and how it's going to um, affect our customers, but also affect the company and uh, more generally affect the open source community. So we're very much focused on open source projects versus products. Um, and today I'd like to talk about um, policy compliance using SIGStore and the more general context of software supply chain. And um, we'll get more into that, but as you've probably heard, there's been quite a few problems with, uh, with our, um, software supply chain. So my, my initial question would be, who here has uh, thought or investigated a bit the uh, software supply chain issues that we've been hearing about? Right, and who, else, and who has uh, ever heard of SIGStore? All right, so I will go a bit into detail about SIGStore. Uh, but Joe, first I'd like to start with a general context. So it's been said, uh, I've never been able to actually find a quote, but it's probably true that Kubernetes relies on about a thousand dependencies. So that means when you're pulling, when you're using Kubernetes itself, it's built on another thousand uh, open source components further upstream. Uh, this raises the immediate question, do you know what these thousand pieces are? Do you trust them? Do you think they have any issues? Uh, basically, do you know what's coming in to your system? Um, it's a really hard question to answer, and most of us can't answer that question properly. This, I'm talking about this in the context, so as I was saying, of software supply chains. Um, most, and mo most companies now use software, almost all of them, and uh, we're all dependent on software from third parties, from other parties. The software we receive and we use, whether we use it in production or we build other software on, on it, um, can contain vulnerabilities and that puts you at risk. It puts everybody at risk. Um, the software supply chain has been a way to get attacks to function in recent times more and more. Uh, you may have heard of the SolarWinds incident where the US uh, government got basically attacked by running an update. So running updates is generally a good thing, but in this case, if the update itself is compromised at the uh, vendor level, then you're bringing in uh, malicious code to your organization. Uh, there are many, um, there are many, oh, I can get a pointer, yeah, excellent. There are many uh, type of supply chain attacks. I'm not gonna go into them, but this is just to give you an idea that it's a huge problem. Um, it's a huge problem, and I'm gonna try and give you a brief overview of where we think you can attack. And basically the answer is everywhere. Um, on your left here in the green thing, we have basically code as it's being uh, built by programmers and, and developers. Um, in the yellow part, we basically have where it's being packaged, you know, a software factory, a build system. And on the right, in purple, it's anybody who consumes software. And you can attack basically, oh, that was a bit quick for the end, but basically everywhere. Um, I mean, really, like, you can attack a developer's machine and try and uh, compromise the code there. You can compromise the way the uh, build system builds, the, builds the, the, the packages, you can compromise the container registry to provide bad containers, you can compromise the dependencies of what your developers are using, you can compromise the system that your reviewers are basing, are, are using to do their reviews. Essentially, it, it really is sort of everywhere and that's a, a huge issue. So thankfully, um, no, thankfully we'll get to that in a sec, but the first, the one other thing I wanna add is that this is not, it's a problem that concerns open source and it concerns open source, some say even more, because everybody uses everybody else's uh, software as a basis. So open source has this very virtuous circle of allowing people to build on other people's code, and you basically stand on the shoulders of giants. So that's a very positive thing. It has brought the open source community you know, forward by leaps and bounds, and it makes it possible to build really impressive and useful things very quickly but it means everybody relies on everybody else's code. Um, and so this makes it a, a, a big problem in open source, but not only because it's been said also earlier today, and I think we are all now aware of this, a lot of proprietary software and even internal proprietary software, even internal open source software um, also relies on upstream open source. Basically open source is what we've been calling the innovation engine. Everybody is basing their code on open source. And so this concerns everybody. It's not just a purely open source community pro, uh, problem. However, the open source community is uh, trying to tackle this and is working towards um, you know, solving this. And it has been for a while because um, 
supply chain attacks are not something new. They've been around for a while. They're just getting a lot of attention now because the problem has become even more obvious as open source has become even more of an obvious thing to use. Um, one thing you can do, which has been done for a while, is signing software. You can use cryptography and you can create crypto cryptographic keys to sign your software and that will enable you to prove who it came from and to prove that it hasn't been tampered with. The only problem is it's hard. It's hard because you have to create a key, but more importantly, you have to maintain that key. Creating a key is easy. We can do this on, on this laptop in three minutes. But maintaining that key and making sure it stays secret and that nobody takes it from you and then can sign in your name, that's hard. And maintaining a key over a long period of time or having a good system to rotate keys and to manage keys for multiple developers, that's always been hard. And it's still hard. Um, and I'd like to show you the state of a few uh, major projects and how they do software signing to try and protect their users. So the Linux kernel uses uh, PGP signing, so it's, it's uh, asymmetric cryptography. It's been used for a long time. Um, they use what is called TOFU, so trust on first use. We assume that the first time we see a signature, it comes from the right person, and then we check after that that it's always, if it's, if it's changed or not, if uh, it seems to come from someone else. But, you know, a lot of things basically just have keys on their website. So to check if something's the, coming from the Python community, for instance, all you can do is go on their website, check that the key matches what you're seeing and matches the signature, and hope that the website's not been compromised. And you have to do it. This is different if you want to go for open SSL. Um, so there, there is no overarching system, for instance. Everybody has a different system here. If you look at, if you look at uh, package managers, especially um, programming language package managers, the situation is even worse. Uh, the, Python, um, the Python package index uh, has an optional signature system. Maven, the, Maven the, Java, the Java one, is one that uses it really. That's good. Go doesn't have it. Rust doesn't have it. So when you pull code in your Rust program, it's not even verified. It's not even checked that what you are pulling really is what you think it is. So this is a great way to slip in attacks and to basically put people at risk. So this is where I'd like to tell you a bit more about Sigstore, uh, which is a solution to this problem. Sigstore is a project that was born um, out of the mind of, um, of, of two people, uh, Dan Lawrence at Google and uh, Luke Hines at Red Hat, who's my team leader. Um, and the point of Sigstore is to try and make this easier, to try and make software signing, which we know is useful, but it's hard to do, a lot easier. So basically, it tries to make it simple, easy, and automatic. Those are very desirable qualities uh, when you're developing software because it, the easier it is and the more automatic it is, the more people will use it and the more you will have this guarantee, this built-in guarantee that signing provides uh, in your code. Um, the idea really is to make it what we call invisible infrastructure. So it, it's just there. You don't need to think about it. Software gets signed and therefore it means software can get verified pretty easily. Um, so not going into all of it, we don't need to read all of this, but basically Sigstore is two things. It's a collection of open source projects um, that you can use on their own or together. And they are all designed to be cloud native. So they all run under Kubernetes. They were designed with that in mind. And it's also, and this is in progress, it's a, a public good service. Um, just like uh, Let's Encrypt, if you know Let's Encrypt, that sort of helped to generalize the use of uh, TLS certificates for websites by making it very easy to, uh, to get a certificate and automated it, so automated and easy. Um, that's what we're trying to replicate in time with the Sigstore public good service. So you'll be able to use the Sigstore service to check and to store, uh, to store signatures about software. Um, and it also comes with what we call a trust route, which I'll go into in a little bit. Uh, a trust route is a way for everybody to agree on a fundamental starting point for trusting, for making trust decisions. And we hope that the Sigstore trust route can be used by the overall open source community and even everybody who needs it to, um, to check and verify um, soft, uh, trust decisions, essentially. Um, these are dif different projects that um, come under Sigstore. Uh, without going into too much detail, we have a certificate authority, we have a signature transparency log, and we have a tool to sign and to verify. Initially, it was containers, which is why it's called Cosign, but it really it enables you to sign pretty much anything you need to sign and to verify it uh, against uh, the Recore signature transparency log and 
by using the Falsio certificate authority to check. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the technical aspect. It's all on the website if you want to see. You'll see a slide in a sec with an overall um, diagram. I'm not going to dive into it because it's a bit complicated. I don't think it's necessary, but we can go back to it later on if there are questions. So this is the diagram. Um, yeah, we'll just skip it for now because there, there's a lot of moving parts here, and I'm not sure it's necessary right now. Um, but what SigStore is based on is uh, a lot of uh, what we call what I call Merkle trees and um, the SHA-256 um, secure hash algorithm. So it enables you to take a digest of a piece of binary data and get uh, a digest that is always the same. And so that's a good basis on which to build um, a transparency log, which is which, what we're doing here. It's what is used in blockchains, what's used in, in Git and other certificate transparency system. And it has the capacity of very, making it very easy to detect any malicious change. So if on this public log we have where people can send in their signatures, they sign a piece of software, they send that, that signature into the public log. Um, if anybody were to try and tamper with that, it would be very evident. So we can have this public auditable log where um, it's easy to send information, but it's very hard to make it lie, uh, which is what we want for a public uh, transparency system. Um, so in summary, what is, so what is SigStore? It's something to easily sign and to verify uh, software. It's, in, it's entirely open source, 100% open source, including the tooling around it and the configurations. Um, it's already active. Um, it's being developed all the time. It's a very fast moving ecosystem. And uh, it's already under soft launch, as we say. So the public good service is not entirely ready, but it's, you can already start playing with it. It'll be, you, there's no guarantee that it's going to stay the same, but you can already start playing with it. It's a nonprofit, and it's run under Linux Foundation. And it was, so as I was saying, it was started at Red Hat, Google, also Purdue University, and anybody who else who wants to join us. Basically, this is a fast-growing ecosystem, and we encourage people to join. Um, right, so we've talked about SigStore. Another thing I want to talk about is um, software policy, basically how you choose to allow software on your systems or not. Uh, what, what makes that decision? Um, that's a tricky question because just because you know what a piece of software is doesn't mean you should necessarily deploy it in production. It could have vulnerabilities. It could have licensing issues in your spe specific situation. So one way, so one thing to think about when we think about sort of making these decisions and building software and creating uh, decisions, having decisions around software, is that human action raises the chance of errors. So the more you rely on people to make decisions and to take actions, the more likely when it gets repetitive, people are likely to make a mistake. Um, I mean, I like humans are great. I like humans. I'm, I'm a human myself, but um, you know, we don't like doing repetitive stuff, and so. That's better left to machines. Um, machines are very good at repetitive stuff, and that's, that, you know, computers are good at that, and you know, that's what, why they're annoying, but also why they're very good. They, they are very good at the repetitive stuff. So basically, this means when you're building software as a way to avoid mistakes that people might make, you want to automate your systems. So you want to automate building software. You do that by um, using what's called CICD, Continuous Integration, Continuous Deployment Systems. But you can also do it for policy, your policy decisions that say, for instance, only allow the software on my Kubernetes cluster if three out of five authorized people have said it's okay. So that's a policy decision. And that is also good to try and automate and to try and make visible. So there are policy tools for that. And what does this mean in more practical terms? Because it's a bit abstract, you know, um, use CICD or use policy tools. Um, so if we're talking about building software and starting from a piece of, of, a piece of code and turning it into something that other users can actually use and deploy on their systems. Um, we want to use a CI CD system. For instance, if you're using Kubernetes, the one we're looking at is called Tekton Pipelines. Um, and that runs in Kubernetes quite simply. And it basically takes your, your upstream code and it turns it into a, uh, into a build, into a packaged piece of software. And we have an extension to it called Chains, which makes it possible to sign. So we were talking earlier about signing software. So this is what Tekton Chains can do. It can sign a piece of software for you. So that, that's helpful. We'll, we'll keep that in mind. And for making policy decisions, um, then what we want to use, what we're using here is a thing called OPA, which stands for Open Policy Agent. It's a tool that enables you to describe a policy that you want for your servers. As I was saying, for instance, only allow this on my servers if three out of five people have signed it, and turn that into code, which makes it very reproducible. Mary, 
but you can rely on it to always be the same and always give the same results without, you know, you can, you can create complex policies if you want, but you can automate the policy, and that's really the point. And it would be really convenient if we could apply that policy to our Kubernetes cluster and say, oh, only allow this on the cluster, as I was saying, if three out of five people have signed it. Well, this is where we have OPA Gatekeeper. Um, it's a gatekeeper, as its name implies. Basically, in Kubernetes terms, it's what's called an admission controller. So it will only allow on your, on your Kubernetes cluster if uh, the situation matches the policy. So now we've automated building software and we've automated the policy around deploying it or even around building it if we want. Um, why, so why would we want to do this? Well, I like to look at it this way. Basically, what, so here are some principles that we want to apply to this that give us some good benefits. Um, one of the things you want to do is try and make your tasks in building software, um, you want to try and make them small. The smaller they are, the easier it is to think about them. Uh, if you have a long, complex task of, you know, pull the software from this bit, then apply this patch, then do this, then do that, it gets hard to understand. But if you keep each step very simple, it's a lot, easy, it's a lot easier to, to reason about it. Uh, you get better visibility about what's happening in your build pipeline. And also, each step being smaller, with the small step atomicity, as it's called, uh, principle, means each step is less risky. You reduce the attack surface of the step, and also if something goes wrong, you reduce what's called the nickname, the blast radius. So if somebody manages to attack your build system and to put into it and to, to compromise it, well, if they can only compromise a tiny bit of it, then the damage they can make is much smaller. So by keeping things small, you basically have better control over, um, over what happens in your system. You have better visibility. And so this improves the control you have over your infrastructure. Um, Keeping tasks small, thinking and reasoning in small batches and small things gives you essentially better risk management. You have better control over attack surface and a, a, a over blast radius. So yeah, keep things small is a very good approach, both for your policy to reason about it and both for your build systems. Um, right, so we've talked about six door and we talked about um, automating things and trying to automate both policy and build systems. So this is a bit more of a vision now. It's a bit more experimental. This is something we've been thinking about in the office of the CTO at Red Hat, is how can we use these different things to try and protect us against the problems we were talking about earlier, which are, remember the, the graph with like all the potential attacks? So they can happen everywhere, but we could potentially check things everywhere. If we know that every time we receive a piece of, uh, of data from the previous step in our build process, we know that it's been signed and we can verify, it makes it very hard to start cheating if you're an attacker. Um, so yeah, so what can we do to, to protect against this, this large breadth of attack? Well, so we need to be able to verify the software all the way, from all the way from upstream, like the, the people contributing to purely open source projects, all the way down to the moment you're putting it on your servers in production. This whole big range of, of open source software, um, this whole chain, if you will, um, we'd, we'd like to be able to verify and check at each step. And so the good news is that we do have tools at this point to, to build that. And we're thinking about it with six store in mind a lot. Um, so here's the idea we have. So what we'd like, and I think this is a shared vision with other people in, in, the, in the open source community uh, thinking about software supply chain problems, is that, so we'd want to be able to attest our whole software supply chain from the upstream commits all the way down to the production runtime. And um, at each step, we want everything to be cryptographically signed because that's extremely hard to forge. Um, to be measured so we can basically check that we're getting what we think we're getting and we're not getting something else. We can verify who it comes from and that it is what we think it is. Uh, we're not getting version, compromised version of, of a library. We're getting the, the one the developer, the author of it intended. Um, we want to make sure that we're using a common root of trust so we can all relate back to this common thing we trust to make our, our trust decisions. Um, and, we, uh, and we basically want to put all that in a log that is only that is append only. So you can't modify the log. All the decisions, all the all the signatures and everything, they're in a log that can only be added to. So it can't be compromised and it can't be changed. Um, I won't go into all the tools too much. We've mentioned some of it. Um, we've got SigStore. So as I was saying, that basically gives you the ability to sign and verify containers, binaries, but also configurations. For instance, uh, we talked about uh, Tecton Chains, which enables you to sign your builds when you're doing a, a CI CD pipeline. OPA is the, um, the one that makes, allows policy. And I'll just briefly introduce Keylime. Um, Keylime is a tool that we've been working on for a while, which makes it possible 
to, um, to trust a remote server that you don't have control over. Uh, modern servers come with this chip called a TPM, uh, which enables you, which it stands for a trusted platform module. And by using that little chip in the server, we can basically verify that it boots normally and that it boots into something we trust, into a known good operating system. So that means we can basically start computers, start servers remotely, but have a high degree of confidence that they started in the real version of you know, um, Fedora or RHEL or Ubuntu or whatever operating system you're using. Um, we, we know that it's starting the good version of the operating system, not a modified version of the operating system that we might not trust. Um, so going back to our su software supply chain, basically, as I was saying earlier, in green, we have the upstream source code. In yellow, we have the part where we build the, the software from the source code. And in purple, we deploy at runtime. And what we want conceptually is to be able to pass between the upstream source code and the authors um, a signature. And then again, between the build system and the deployment uh, systems, another signature. So we want to do this along the way. These are just examples of what, you know, what, where your upstream source code comes from, how it's being built, um, and what it's run on at the end. So there's a variety of solutions. In practice, this means we get an upstream uh, piece of code. We take, so like say, a tarball of, of source code. We sign it with SigStore, and then we store that signature in SigStore in the component called Recore. OK, we've got a signature. Then, so you can take code from either uh, open source upstream or your own internal uh, code. Both go into the same build system. And here's what we would like. We want the build system to, when it receives this thing to build, it checks it, again, using SigStore. Um, then it builds it automatically. This is a text on chain bit. It checks, and it, it checks against the policy. So this is where OPA comes. It comes in again, sorry. And it checks using, and it, it builds on a system that we know is a trusted system, it's as trusted as possible, because it's run, it uses Keyline. And then when it's finished building, it again uses SigStore to sign it itself. So we've got another signature that says, I took it from a known good source, I did my job, I did my job in a good environment, and now here's the result, and I'm signing this, so you can check it later. And the next step is then we have our deployment, so our actual production servers. Uh, and again, these will be on the system that is measured using Keyline. As they receive the software, they will check that it's valid, that it has not been compromised using SigStore again. Um, they'll choose to deploy it or not depending on a policy, which is again where OPA comes in. And lastly, we can do an extra um, neat little thing, which is Keylime can check your server continuously to check that it's not being modified while it runs. So the software you've deployed, um, you can check that it's actually not being modified while it is running. So that's a very interesting uh, capacity, and it makes sure that your systems, once they've been started in a good state, stay in a good state. Otherwise, you can sort of start making decisions. Um, so brace yourself. The next one is a bit, there's a lot of stuff on the next one, uh, but it's just to give you an overview of what the overall picture looks once you start combining policy, um, automating the builds, and signing everything. So there's, there's a lot, obviously, uh, because there's a lot of moving pieces. But um, it's essentially what we've been talking about. So you get your code from the upstream, you sign it, you send all these signed measurements, all, all the signed software, you send it into your build systems. Your build systems check that it conforms to policy. Once they're done, uh, once they've checked the signatures and everything, they can sign themselves. And eventually, you, you, um, you deploy this on servers that you think uh, you have good, you have strong guarantees about their, uh, their integrity because they're running, they're using Keylime, and they're running good operating systems that you know. And with all this, what really matters, I think, are the bits at the bottom. Um, that's, that's what I would most like to try and convey to you, which is we were saying at the beginning how hard it is to sign and how hard it is to do all of this. What we really want for this to work for everybody is for you know, the software signing part, the, the, the verification of signing, to be easy for developers, to be automatic in the middle. So all the systems that build it, all that is automatic. Most people should not have to worry about it. And on your production servers to make it as safe as possible. And with that, you really can catch a lot of the attacks we were looking at in the beginning, because you've got basically signatures, a little signature there and there. You, you have them pretty much everywhere throughout your system, which makes it possible which makes it very hard to cheat and very good to verify. So we, we really can prevent a lot of attacks here. Um, and in more business terms, what does this give us? Well, so it reduces the attack surface. So it makes it harder to attack. Your attack surface is smaller. 
uh, because we've removed a lot of um, possible attacks. And so this improves risk management. Um, we have better risk management because there's less attacks. We have better cost management because we don't have to uh, answer to so many attacks. And it uh, enhances your business capabilities because you have to worry less and you can build more, essentially. Um, it also gives us better traceability. It's easier to go back and see what happened because everything is logged and everything is signed at every step. Um, so that's faster analysis. And if or slash when you get compromised, it's easier to remediate because it's faster to figure out where something went wrong. Again, that gives us risk management and cost management. And it improves the trustworthiness of your systems overall because you have a better idea of what's running, why it's running, how it's running. Um, so this is both true for build, build systems and production systems. And again, in terms of business um, point, this gives us risk management and cost management. How far are we from actually achieving this? So as I was saying, this is a vision. This is something we've been working on. This we've been thinking about it. We've been trying to combine all these open source tools to make it work. Um, so some of these tools have been in production for quite a while. Uh, Keylime, for instance, is in production. IBM has a cloud that is using Keylime. So all the machines are verified as they boot. Um, some are still growing. Um, for instance, uh, for instance, Sixdoor is a very active project. Things are being built all the time. We're also needing a pro there's something we don't have yet. It's a common standard, a format, a way of exchanging data between each of these steps that all the tools can understand. There's a project called Intoto, um, which is designed to sort of pass attestations about software as it's being built. It's a likely candidate. Intoto is quite cool. Um, we'll see if that becomes the, the standard, the format, or not. And we have a slight problem, for instance, that some tools can sign, but they can't verify yet. So it's great for future reference, but they can't yet uh, check a signature and then make a decision or build or not according to that. So that's, that's currently the state with Tekton Chains, but hopefully it'll change. And as I was saying in the beginning, everyone is concerned. This is not just an open source, like a small, the open source community is huge, but it's not limited to the open source community. It's, um, it's, it, it's important to everybody because everybody relies on open source. So this is why you know, we want to build this uh, as a community. We want, everybody, we want to invite everybody to join and to take part in this. Um, so if you want to go and have a, um, a look at the different projects, I've listed two here, which are two of the biggest ones. So you can go to sixdoor.dev or keylime.dev to check out those, uh, those tools. And uh, they're both on GitHub, of course. They're open source projects. They all have chats, so you can easily find the, uh, the Keylime Slack or the Sigstore Slack, uh, which is the CNCF. Sorry, the Keylime uh, Slack is the CNCF, Cloud Native Computing Foundation Slack. Um, so feel free to join. Uh, if you've got questions, if you want to try and build something with it, Sigstore is being used by a lot of people to build new, interesting, and cool things. So this is very community oriented, so please don't hesitate to come and ask questions. And lastly, it's my contact if you'd like to, to talk to me specifically. Um, and with this, I'd like to open up to questions if anybody has uh, any questions. Yeah. Uh, do you mind going to the slide where you have the overall picture, please? Right. So on the first part where it says substream source code, you mentioned at the very beginning that Rust doesn't have signing. Yep. Yeah. Right? So how does these pipeline happens when you don't have signing on the upstream code? So you could, for instance, um, if it's going to be an internal thing, or if you could, you could sign your own, you could use cosign to sign your Rust package, and that will upload that signature to SigStore as a service. Right. And then somebody else, if they have your package, so you'll have to distribute your package in another way, but if they get your piece of Rust code, then they can check from SigStore that the signature is all good. And then they, they can trust you. I mean, as long as they trust you, <laughs> they can trust that piece of Rust code. And we're working, at event, I mean, the goal is in time for Sigstore to be integrated automatically in, in Rust and in Ruby and in Python and in NPM so that when somebody writes a piece of Rust code and they want to put it on crates.io, they just, it's automatically signed for them. And so what this means by automatically is that they write the code, they say, OK, I'm sending this to the repositories, and then there's a pop-up that co comes up on the computer and says, oh, we just, who are you signing this is? So you sign into your, maybe your Google account, maybe your GitHub account, maybe your company's um, you know, internal account. You sign in, and it proves it's you, and that, that's enough. That's all you have to do. And you don't have to maintain a key. That's the whole point of six stories. You don't have to maintain a long-term key. You sign, that's it. You don't have to worry after that. Sixter effectively takes away the whole 
management of key rotation. Yeah. How do you ensure how does SIGSTOR keeps logging of that rotation internally? So what so that you can do uh, auditability on it. Yeah. So the way we do it is one of the hardest things to do in signing software is maintaining keys. So the core question that SIGSTOR asks, which is quite clever, is say, what if we didn't have keys to manage? What if we create a key, we sign, and then we throw the key away? So we don't have to manage it. It can't be taken because it's already been destroyed. And so all you need, all you need to do, sounds easy, but all you need to do at that point is to check that that person who signed that thing really had that key at that point in time. And so going back to this much earlier one, let's see if I can find it briefly, which is the more technical one here. So what happens is that basically when you want to sign, you get a certificate that as you tell the you tell Fulcio you have a key. In exchange, if you can prove that's what I was talk, talking about with the pop-up, if you can prove uh, at that moment in time that you do own that address using it's called OpenID Connect OIDC. If you can prove that, then Fulcio will do two things. It'll give you a certificate that says this email address has this key. And you're fine to throw it out after, but it'll give you that certificate. With that certificate, you can sign, and it gets stored in ReCore. So your signature gets stored. The signature on the software gets signed in ReCore, and your, uh, your certificate gets, signed in, gets stored in Fulcio. So when someone comes later, they find a signature. They say, what key was this? They find a key. They say, did this really belong to this person? They go and look in Fulcio. They find a certificate that says, at this point in time, this person owned this key. They don't have it anymore, but it doesn't matter, because when they signed, they did. And so you can, you can check that it's good. Cool. Yeah. It's what they call keyless signing. There is a key, but it's just, it, it's just put in, me in live memory and then it's destroyed. So you really don't need to worry about it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, do you have plans to explore reproducible builds and integrating that with the transparency log? Um, ideally, this is all done with reproducible builds. It's, to me, it's a sort of a parallel track to it. it, it you should be doing reproducible builds anyway if you can, uh, but you really should. But a lot of, a lot of people working on all this um, sort of open source so, so software supply chain are thinking a lot about, I'm trying to go back to the, I don't know, it might not be the best one to have in mind, but um, yeah, a lot of people who are thinking about this sort of overall pictures are thinking a lot about reproducible builds. If only because if we have reproducible builds, we get the same signatures from the same keys. We get at least the same hashes on them, which means it's much easier to verify because if you and I have a different build, checking that they were okay is very hard. Well, you know this, obviously, because it's why you're asking about <laughs> reproducible builds. But um, reproducible builds, for those who might not know, means that two people building the software independently will arrive at the same exact result, which means it's much easier, for instance, to check a signature. Like, once you go and ask the record transparency log up there, um, if this piece of software that has this hash is okay, if we all have the same reproducible build, then we can all check the signature much more easily because we're all checking against the same exact package. So, I, so, the answer, the, so that's a bit of a long answer, but the shorter answer is there is no current, this doesn't include any specific thoughts about reproducible build, but it does sort of take them for granted. Or, you know, they're just kind of obvious at this point that you should be doing that, but nothing specific about it. Are there any other questions? All right, then. Well, thank you very much for coming. And uh, yeah, cheers.